everybody. Um, thank you all for, for joining this uh, uh, Zoom on Friday afternoon, uh, this real estate town hall. I hope you're all doing very well um, and that you're looking forward to a great weekend. Um, so thank you again for joining. Uh, as we go along, uh, if you have questions, there's a chat box. I'm sure most of you have done the, the Zoom uh, before, the chat box below. Please feel free to ask any questions you have as we go along. Don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, I plan to make the presentation as concise and as educational as possible so that ultimately you find value in it. Um, I'm going to first start with a quick bio and then we'll move to uh, a discussion on how to time the market. We'll talk about rules and roadblocks uh, in selling real estate today. And then uh, last, we'll talk about how do we actually sell a home safely today um, during, uh, during the pandemic. Um, okay, so uh, as far as the bio, so my name is Alan Taylor. I'm an estates director uh, as well as executive director of the trusted probate division for my firm Compass in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I'm also a second generation realtor and third in my family to sell real estate. My father is still an office manager on the boulevard today and has been since 1977 when he opened the first John Douglas office in the valley. Um, also my aunt and uh, John Arrow, who is a uh, legend in LA real estate, were partners in the 90s. So multiple family members uh, in, in my family have been in the real estate business. Um, and I've been in a real estate uh, office since I could walk. So um, I've been selling real estate full time for 15 years. And prior to that, I was in mortgage banking for, for five years. Um, and my office is located in Sherman Oaks, um, and my practice is for the most part focused on the San Fernando Valley, although I bought and sold homes all over Los Angeles. Um, okay, so let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So, and talk about, you know, how do we time the market? Um, so if you're, you know, like most sellers out there, you you know, you're wanting to time the sale of your home just right so that it captures the most amount of buyers at one time, ultimately allowing it to sell for as much money as possible. And every year that's springtime, you know, late April, early, early May, the rain is gone, uh, it's warmed up, the landscaping and the flowers are beautiful, um, you know, the, it just blowing up with color. And over the past several years, each spring, we've been fortunate to have, you know, favorable interest rates, uh, low inventory, and strong, drive, uh, strong buyer demand driving up prices uh, year over year since 2012. And we were set to have a banner year uh, in 2020, um, and then coronavirus happened, which none of us, or obviously very few, were expecting. So um, as you probably know, um, there has been a very strong impact on the real estate market during the, la during the first 45 days of shelter in place. I'd like to kind of talk about what's happened and then where we've come so you can see the progression. Um, you know, over the first, 45 days, we experienced uh, an above average cancellation rates of, of properties because of job loss, uh, reduction in income, uh, simple fear of the unknown, and some who are not able to move forward because their loan program was pulled right in the middle of escrow, so transaction volume just plummeted. It didn't go quite to zero, um, but the real estate market seized up pr pretty badly. So thankfully things have changed quite a bit over the last 30 days. Um, new listings have been coming to market and are being sold to buyers who, ha who have to purchase because of a job transfer uh, or a 1031 exchange. And not just those that have to, that, that have to buy. We're now getting you know, families that are, that are growing families who are, you know, don't like the small space that they're in now and they wanna you know, shelter in place in a larger space. Um, you know, we also are, 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 are uh, have the largest pool of, uh, of home buyers in 27 years, um, you know, millennials and these, these, these the household formation buyers that are coming at us in 27 years. So there's a, there's a big uh, amount of buyers that are going to be coming into the marketplace. And just to give you a general perspective, it, it, it just seems like, you know, the first 30 days or 45 days of coronavirus, people were kind of wondering, you know, what is it? Am I going to get sick? Um, what is sheltering in place home? How do I run my business from home? How do I handle my, my child care? So, you know, the level of uncertainty and the amount of change and the stress that we were going through was so overwhelming. People just didn't want to even talk about real estate. They're just like, real estate, what? I got to figure, 
kind of figure out how to how my life is going to be. And you know, as we're looking at the shelter in place orders that are coming our way, you know, we now have some visibility as to what that looks like, right? There's I think five levels. Um, and obviously the essential businesses are the, are the first ones and then we go all the way to major sporting events at, at five level five and i think a lot of us just realize we're, we're not going back to work like we're not going to go to the office um you know for a while schools may be closed the schools we know schools are closed for the rest of the calendar year not sure about the rest of the year so i think people are just basically kind of stir crazy they want to move on with their lives and um, they're going out and buying and uh, and buying real estate, um, you know, and they want to find their their place in the world. So uh, that's a that's a somewhat positive sign. As far as the safety concerns, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. So uh, you know, on the supply side, when it comes to supply and demand, um, you know, many potential sellers had to change their mind about selling because their job offer fell through. Um, some now can't afford to move up until things settle down. Um, you know, that's just further reducing the supply of homes uh, on, on the market and, um, you know, sh is going to help stabilize, uh, you know, prices. Um, you know, there's obviously, you know, very strong unemployment. We'll, we'll show you a couple slides in a minute. Um, you know, and that's going to have a negative effect, effect on the market. It's interesting. We're kind of in this period of time right now where um, fewer people are putting their houses on the market. Inventory in these price ranges is extremely low. Interest rates are falling, which I'll show you. And so if you put your house on the market today in, in, in many price ranges, I would say 2 million and below, multiple offers are happening. And it's kind of shocking, you know, as a, as a it's kind of, it's, I guess it's shocking and it's not, right? If you just look at supply and demand, if there's nothing for sale and buyers want to go out there and buy, then that house is going to get multiple offers. So that's what we see happening right now in the, in the price ranges below two. We'll, we'll talk about above three in a minute. Um, Michael, why don't we go ahead and start looking at some slides? You could put up the... Okay, so the first slide here is, is basically showing the impact of COVID-19 to real estate showings in North America. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you see that little thing that says showing time. That is basically, a, a, you know, it's a website that kind of tracks the, the amount of showing requests, the amount of showings that are taking place. And if you look at it on the left side of the graph where that blue line is, you see January. And if you, and you in the middle where the uh, yellow arrow stops, you see March. So that's obviously when the pandemic started and you can see it just fell completely. And that's that 30 day period of time where people were trying to figure out, you know, their shelter in place, what does it mean? And now that they've kind of figured out their lives, the last four weeks shows that there's a lot more buyers who are now out um, going to see properties and looking. Uh, Michael, if we can go to the next slide. All right, so, and this is just a, a, another slide to throw in. I mean, look at the median asking price of rent since 1988 to 2020. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, gonna be leasing a, I'm leasing a 2,000 square foot house um, for 5,300. I leased one late, um, middle of last year for 6,300. That was 1,700 square feet on Valley Heart, just east of Fulton. So the rental prices are, are really high. And so the, buy, you know, potential, you know, buyers are looking at the rental prices, which are still high. We'll talk about rental prices, you know, later. Um, it, it kind of promotes the idea that it might be better to buy than it is to, to, to rent when, when you look at prices. Um, Michael, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is a breakdown of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, from May 8th. Um, as you can see, the report covers up until, you know, April 12th. We're going to see worse numbers um, next month when the new report comes out. I think we're, you know, what I'm hearing is numbers in the 25% unemployment rate, which is obviously just, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's unfortunate. It's, it's, it's sad. It's, you know, a lot of people are obviously going to be hurting. And so if you look at the left side, currently it shows that there's, as of, as of uh, May 8th, 85% uh, of people still employed, 14.7% unemployed. But the point of this particular chart is if you look to the, to the chart on the right at the top, you, you see temporary versus permanent. 
So there's a lot of discussion about some of the employment being temporary. Um, you know, and, 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 and so if, if a lot of people do go back to work, that'll obviously, will obviously help. Um, and I can just tell you now as a listing agent on, you know, these, you know, I've got a few, several properties in escrow right now and getting a lot of phone calls. There's, there's just still a lot of wage earners out there that are employed. There's still a lot of industry people or business owners. Um, you know, they are hurting to some degree with respect to current cash flow, but they still have a financial capacity to purchase. And so they're looking at, you know, basically where they are in their lives and they're still willing to go ahead and purchase. Um, so that's obviously some good news. Michael, can we go to the next one, please? Okay, so at the bottom, you'll see that this is talking about years for unemployment rate to return to the pre-crisis level. This just kind of piggybacks on the prior slide that we were looking at. Um, look down to the right where you see the, the, the text where it says Great Recession, and then the white one is Great Depression. Okay, just those two, right? So if you look at the Great Recession, which is the yellow one, um, it took 10 years for the employment level to return to, you know, where it was when the recession happened. And obviously the Great Recession, the Great Depression took, uh, was that, 13, 13 years. And then, so if you look at Goldman, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs is, I think, considered one of the, you know, it's considered one of the, um, the authorities, obviously, uh, in terms of, you know, managing people's money and what's going on in the economy and the world and things like that. Um, they did a two-year projection and basically said by year two, we'll be, we'll be pretty close to all the way back. Um, you know, I, I kind of scratching my head a little bit on that one, but hopefully they're, hopefully they're right. Um, the two years is also a long time. So, you know, that's obviously a positive sign. Uh, J, JP Morgan was only willing to do a one-year projection and they showed that we'll be having a very sharp rebound in terms of the number of people that are back to work. So, those are some positive signs in terms of people being able to come back from, uh, you know, their current furloughs or, um, or, or joblessness. Um, Michael, can we go to the next one, please? Okay, and, and uh, this one just basically says home price change during the last five recessions. And if you look up, 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 up above, you see the, the last five. Um, we are technically in a recession right now. A recession is uh, defined as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And, you know, the reality is, is you know, it's just, it's, it's two consecutive negative quarters of, of GDP growth. So you can still be doing very well and do not so well for a quarter and not so as well as you did the prior quarter. And you're still, you still have output. The economy is still producing. Things are still good. And obviously you can have uh, prices go up. Um, 2000, 2008, and 9 was just an absolute housing crash and a mortgage meltdown. Um, that was obviously very painful. So, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, home values and prices as we go along. Michael, let's look at the 30 year rate mortgage. I think that's the next slide, isn't it? Yeah. So we're, we're looking at the lowest interest rates in history. If you look at the blue bar up top, you see 2018. 2019 and then 2020. If you you know if you go back to 16, 15, 14, 13, you know rates were in the in the sixes, and if you go back to seven, eight, nine, rates were in the sixes and the sevens. Um, but look at the 2018 column and scroll down to the bottom where it says November. If you see, it says 4.87 percent with half a point. The the second column is how many points you pay to buy the loan down. That's basically a 5% rate. And we went from 4% in January to 5%. There were many realtors who thought that that was kind of going to be the, the change um, in terms of prices, right? Because if the interest rates go up, it affects your afford affordability. But look what happened in 2019. Interest rates in... August were at, or excuse me, September were at 3.61. And now look at obviously what they're doing in 2020, right? In April, of, in April, um, they were recorded at 3.31, uh, with a little bit more than a, a little bit more than half a point, and they're still and they're still dropping. So if the rates drop down, that is just going to do. The only thing that's going to do is spur demand, right? Because we 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 purchase the house based on our payments, and so you know, a seller can theoretically ask more money and a buyer's willing to pay more money if their cost to, to borrow that money is cheaper. So, 
So that's what's going on with with rates. And if that trend continues, obviously that will that will stabilize. Um, let's go to the MLS stats, Michael. Okay. So we're looking at single family homes from Tarzana to Toluca Lake. So in Tarzana, Encino, Sherman Oaks, Studio City, Valley Village, Toluca Lake. Um, if anybody would like information about um, what's going on in price ranges in these other areas, or you guys want these individual slides, you know, please just let me know. And I've broken it down, you know, uh, into one, two, three, four, six or seven categories, seven, seven categories, one, two, three, four, or maybe eight. So if you look at 750 to million, the first one, there's 63 total properties for sale. 33 of them are active. So 52% are active and 48% are under contract. So, and then if you look at the 1 million to about 3 million, you know, we're in between 20 and 30% of the homes are under contract. And if you look at, you know, shelter in place, those numbers were obviously lower. So we're really looking still to some degree, looking at a seller's market, um, you know, you know, again, keep it, keep in mind, this is Tarzana and Sino Sherman Oaks, Studio City, Valley Village, Toluca Lake. If I just looked at, let's say Sherman Oaks only, Hidden Woods, or, you know, whatever neighborhood you want to look at, let's just call it even a school district, and you broke it down into a, you know, one to, to a million, uh, 250, you know, you might have 10, 12 listings with a lot of them, you know, significantly, uh, you know, deferred maintenance or, um, you know, uh, overpriced or a location issue or something like that. So the moment a really good home comes on the market, it, it can still get multiple offers. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of a, a good look there in terms of, you know, how the, how many homes are actually under contract. So it shows us that homes are selling. And then obviously if you look at the three to 5 million range, the number is down to 11%. If you look at 5 million range, you know, there's only, you know, there's 27 homes, on the market, 26 for sale and only one, uh, you know, only one under contract. And that normal, that that number is probably more normally like in the 10 to 15, maybe even 20% range. So the the high end uh, could suffer, you know, a little bit. Um, Michael, is that? I think that's it for those for those slides right now, right? Yeah. Okay. So once you, yeah, there you go. So um, if anybody has questions, let's see, Michael, are there, is anyone asked any questions just yet? I don't think so. Okay. So if anyone has, I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah cool. Right, okay. All right. So, um, you know, as far as timing the market is concerned, um, you know, that just gives you some information as to what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think the question that some of us are having is, you know, as these shelter in place orders continue, um, as you know businesses struggle to get back on their feet um you know obviously some people are talking about a second uh wave and potentially even a second sheltering in place later in the year you know what's that going to do to um the economy and the market and things like that in the future so right now it just feels like we don't quite know and people just want to move on so inventory is tight and um interest rates are low and buyers are out there so so that 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 kind of gives us an idea of what's going on in the market. So now we'll switch to you know rules, roadblocks, and hurdles that we're facing. So as far as our ability to conduct business, um, uh, we you know real estate is essential. Uh, we are following the orders from the mayor's office. Um, agents are allowed to show properties. Um, escrow and title companies are open, and we're obviously closing escrows. Um, a couple weeks ago, we weren't even to, allowed to show an occupied property. The, the order from the mayor's office specifically said, um, you know, showings of occupied homes is prohibited. And, you know, we've, we've, that order has been changed by the mayor's office. We've got new rules and, and protocol, which we'll, which we'll go over. Um, we are not allowed to hold open houses. Um, if, if a showing takes place, it has to be done by appointment only. Um, and it should be limited to serious buyers, either with a pre-approval letter uh, or they have to submit an offer. And if we do decide to show the house, um, you know, the in-person showing um, can only include the realtor and no more than two people from the same family member, excuse me, from the same family. 
Um, and then of course, if the house is occupied or tenant occupied, um, they would need to exit the property and everybody has to wear a mask and, and, uh, and, and cannot touch anything. So um, I'll get more into some of that later. There's some, some, some new uh, guidelines that we're dealing with. Um, but basically, you know, what this is really doing is just kind of narrowing it down to the most uh, qualified buyers. And that's good for everybody. It just limits exposure. Um, you know, the buyers who want to go out there and, and buy, um, they're going to get their pre-approval and they're going to go out there and they're going to safely purchase. I think we have a question. Okay, so how long do we think current... Uh, environment, low rates, low inventory, reasonable. Do you think June will still be viable for sellers? Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, don't have the crystal ball, of course. Um, yeah, I think as obviously as people get more comfortable and the shelter in place gets lifted more and more, it, naturally I would expect more sellers to get comfortable with the idea of putting their house on the market. Um, so, you know, we, we just don't know about that. Um, you know, as we saw in 2008 through, you know, 12, 13, 14, the government did everything they possibly could to stimulate uh, the economy by artificially purchasing mortgage-backed securities um, and things like that to keep interest rates low. They're doing that, you know, they're, they're doing everything they can to keep interest rates low. Um, so, I mean, I just, I just don't know at this point. Um, but that's a great question. Um, all right, so we were talking about, yeah, we're talking about, you know, how the requirements, the safe requirements to show houses is kind of, you know, it's limited, you know, we're not having open houses, so we're not ha creating these congregations of people. We're not having look you lose come through and things like that. And, and that's, you know, that's, 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 I think it's not, it's not hurting a seller. I think it's just making us more efficient. Um, all right, so let's talk about a couple of the roadblocks. There are these new forms that have been that have come out by, uh, through the California Association of Realtors. Um, Michael, I don't know if you have the CVA. If you want to bring it up, great. If not, I'll just talk about it. Um, it's a it's okay either way. But so um, the coronavirus addendum. Yeah, that's the CVA. Yeah, you know, I don't really need you guys to. I'm going to summarize it for you. But it was created by the Association of Realtors as a way to handle circumstances which the parties could not have anticipated or beyond their control. It's like, what happens if the buyer gets sick in the middle of escrow? What happens if the seller gets sick? What happens if the buyer loses their job? You know, the form attempts to help the parties resolve the issues, and the form can be signed either with the offer or at any point during the escrow if the parties agree. But there's one thing that you got to be very clear about. The parties do not have to agree. Do not have to agree to this form. You know, I had a client closing. I had a client in escrow during the first 30 days of shelter in place, and and I mean, I just I refused to move forward in the deal until I got this signed because I wanted my buyer to be protected. And you know, because it was new in the deal, I was able to negotiate the seller. Um, you know, I represented the buyer um, to agree to have this thing signed. I mean, good luck getting us. I'll, I'll explain why you're not going to have a, a, a be very successful getting a seller to sign this today. Uh, and, and, and if you're a seller, you want to, you know, run away from this thing if, 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 you, if you possibly can. So, you know, it, it, if, you, if, the, if the parties do agree and an unforeseen circumstance occurs, there's an automatic extension period that kicks in. You know, both parties agree to do everything they can in good faith to close the transaction. Um, but, you know, should either buyer or seller not be able to perform within the extension period, there's a clause in there that says either party may elect to cancel the transaction and return the buyer's deposit. So, you know, in a normal real estate transactions under normal circumstances, the seller just ha the seller has no way of canceling the transaction, right? Once the, once the contract is formed and the buyer performs, you know, the deals, the deals, the deals done. Um, and, you know, if you look at from the buy side, you know, if the buyer has removed all contingencies and they don't close their deposits at risk, you know, but obviously we're in a pandemic, a pandemic here. So things are a little bit different. So let's just talk about, you know, this form if you're a seller. So 
while it could give you the ability to delay or cancel the sale, you know, if you got sick, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you really want to extend the buyer additional ways to get out of the purchase, which you may very much uh, be counting on? Maybe you have another property in escrow. Maybe you're moving across the country. Maybe you just really want to sell your, your property. Signing this form is not in your best interest. Um, uh, you know, in that, you know, in those particular situations. So it, it's case by case, but for the most part, we're, we're recommending our sellers not sign that form. And of course, if you're a buyer, you know, depending on the type of job you're in, what kind of conversations that you're having with your boss, you know, um, the possibility of being furloughed or laid off, you know, whatever the case may be, I would recommend you have this form signed. It pr provides an additional protection for your deposit uh, after the release of all buyer contingencies, you know, you can remove, you can, you know, there are people out there whose, whose uh, loan program was pulled, job got terminated the week of the close, and now they're in a fight for the deposits. So if you had this, this, this baked into the, into the deal, your deposit would be, would be protected. Um, Michael, you can pull away from the, the CVA and go ahead and put it back on present. Thank you. So, um, Let's talk about, I don't think we have questions about that, do we? Uh, how do we do it? Okay, cool. Uh, getting on a kind of heaven. Oh, there, I'm sorry. It looks like there's more, more, more questions. Are negotiations getting under contract happening faster than usual? How quickly on average are you seeing buyers under contract? Are multiple offers happening more often than not? Okay, great questions. Um, faster than usual. Faster than usual from the first 30 days of shelter in place. Um, I wouldn't say faster than before, but it can happen very fast. So um, I don't know if you guys, some of you know the Hidden Woods area of, of Sherman Oaks. I had a couple really nice uh, William Mellentine built homes that came up for sale. These are just quality homes in quality locations. Um, you know, no cut through streets, just these really cute, adorable, architecturally um, beautiful homes that people just love. And when those houses come up for sale, like people are still going crazy. And, you know, the process to get under contract maybe takes a little longer. Um, maybe only in a sense that if we list the house for sale, we want to go through that maybe four or five days, six days of, of vetting all the interested buyers, which I'll talk about in a minute, qualifying them and then getting them into the property. What we used to do before is just list the property on a Wednesday have an open house on Friday and Sunday, everybody would come through and then offers would be due on Tuesday. But we have to space the showings out a little bit. We have to kind of go through this process. So <clears throat> it's really only delaying the ability for somebody to go under contract by a few days, maybe half a week at the most. So you can, you can list your house you know, tomorrow if it's priced fairly within comps and you can find yourself uh, under contract within, you know, within a week's time. Um, and let's see what else, uh, buyers on the, how quickly on average, you okay, so that's it. Are multiple offers happening more often than not? Again, just price range, location-based, things like that. Um, I just had multiple offers on a 1899 listing on Woodbridge and Studio City. Um, put a house in escrow on Stonehill and Sherman Oaks, one offer. Um, I just, I just, you know, we showed, a uh, house on Hesby to the first buyer and he wrote a very strong over asking uh, offer and the seller took that. Um, on my Ethel had multiple offers. So yeah. Okay. And is there a similar CBA form for rental agreements? Catherine, good question. Um, there, okay. So you know, I'm not really prepared to spend a whole lot of time talking about the tenant landlord situation, but you know, obviously there are, um, protections, you know, the, since the, the coronavirus pandemic came out, there's been new changes that have been heavily in favor of tenants. Um, so, you know, tenants can basically say I have a hardship and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pay or I can't pay. They've got a 12 month period of time to, to pay it back. Um, but there, there, um, there is no, there is no, nothing that I am aware of that lets somebody out of their lease. Like, so if you go lease, lease a house for 6,000, all of a sudden you're making, you know, four, I'm not aware of any type of CBA form that then just lets you out of your lease. 
uh, I think you just then have to pay it back over time. But you know, you can probably just go to your landlord and, and possibly negotiate it. It's kind of a tricky uh, situation. But thanks for for asking, Catherine. And if you would like to talk about it further, just reach out to me. I've got a tenant landlord attorney that I can um, refer you to. And then Marina said, is there any prospect of a seller's market coming anytime soon? Marina, I'm not sure if you meant buyer's market, but yeah, exactly. Okay, um, uh, to have the buyer's market, we have to have a lot more supply and, and higher rates, right? So the tide, has to, the tide has to shift. So right now we have nothing for sale, low rates and all these buyers, and we're, you know, we're not at the point where interest rates have gone back up and supply you know, has gone up. So I, I just don't know, I don't know. We're gonna have to wait and see. I, I suppose the, you know, if the economy gets worse and more people try to sell their homes as we approach the end of the year in 2021, that could um, put some downward pressure on price, but I think that's just gonna be in certain, in certain price ranges. All right, so let's talk about um, some additional hoops, the financing side of things. So this, this applies to both buyers and sellers, okay? So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the seller side. So, um, well, let's just talk about financing in general. So liquidity in general in the mortgage markets has been impacted by COVID-19, right? Um, you know, and just considering the fact that there's a large threat to home values, um, you know, certain jumbo lenders, you know, which means a loan over 765,000 alternative type uh, loans, like bank statement type loans and things like that, um, have pulled out of the market um, or changed their loan guidelines. So, for example, um, banks were doing 80%, banks were even doing 90% up to 2 million, um, but 80% up to 2 million was very common. Um, and now we're starting to see lenders, you know, say they want 25% down, some saying 30, depending on the borrower type. Um, you know, that was kind of a knee jerk reaction to what was going on. Um, but, you know, we're, we're already starting to hear um, lenders kind of come back into the market, which is obviously a very positive sign. Um, okay, and so, you know, when I'm representing the seller in terms of what that means for us, basically, we just need to do a very good job of understanding the buyer's loan profile, the likeliness that they're going to close. You know, and obviously, if you have multiple offers on a property, you're trying to do the best job that you can to pick the best offer. But let's just say you have one or two, and both of them are getting, you know, a million dollar loan or a nine hundred thousand dollar loan. Maybe they're just doing twenty percent down. You know, it just becomes a, you know, a it's triage. We're just trying to figure out who's the who's the best, but who's whose job is, you know, least likely to be terminated. Um, you know, whose loan profile is the strongest and things like that. I, I'm actually an escrow on a 10% down loan. I think it's a private banking loan through City. And I actually told, you know, I told my seller I was scared to death. And I, and so we called City and City confirmed that I was right, that the loan program is no longer available. But because this buyer had actually already had his loan approved, they were willing to honor it. Um, and, you know, at the time, the price was right. Um, we, we didn't have another offer and the seller except, you know, was willing to go through with it. So we, our fingers are crossed on that one and we're going to see how it goes, but it looks like um, that one is going to close. Um, let's see. I had a couple more notes that I might want to talk about on the seller side. Oh, here's a good trick. Here's something that I'm very, you know, I like doing. So when the contract gets written, you know, provided uh, once the buyer removes their physical inspection contingency, they're pretty much committed to getting the purchase, the, to closing the deal, provided the house appraises and they can get the loan indicated on the contract. So the thing that I'm advocating to all of my junior agents and some of the other people in my office is if the buyer has the financial capacity and is willing to do whatever it takes to get that property, put in force them to to do a larger down payment on the contract because look at the difference right if you put 20 percent down on the contract and it's a jumbo loan the bank comes back at the 11th hour and says sorry i want another i need another five percent down in order to close this loan 
the buyer has the right to walk away. Buyer can just use their loan contingency and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't get my loan, I'm walking away. And that can be, you know, that could be financially, I wouldn't say financially devastating, but it could be, it could be devastating, right? You could sell the house to the next buyer for less money. You could have, you know, 100 pages worth of uh, home inspection reports that you then have to pass along to the next buyer. And it's very stressful to fall out of escrow. So that's something that I'm, that I'm advocating. I did it on, you know, two transactions recently, and we're in this honeymoon phase, and so they're trying to buy the house. And I have control in that situation. You know, I've got another offer, and I'm talking to them, and, you know, I, I kind of have the control, and I got them to agree to it. And that just protects the seller's interest. Let's see, what else can I, um, yeah, so and then on the buyer's side, we talked a little bit about um, private banking, um, you know, there's, there's different ways to get a mortgage today, right? You can go to your credit union, you can go to your bank, you can go to a mortgage broker, you can go to a direct lender, all these different types of, of places out there. So the buyer, the buyer may just have to call around a little bit more until they find the, the, um, the financing that's right for them, especially if they have a smaller down payment. But, but financing is, uh, you know, is available. Uh, let's see, are there any more? Uh, another good question. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, is a buyer's market... Is it a buyer's market over three million? Um, I don't. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's a buyer's market over three million for sure. But you know, we're we're it's kind of interesting. We're experiencing a lot of, you know, sellers and new construction sellers kind of holding their properties off the market. If they just if and there's a lot of properties in the three, you know, two and a half to three and a half, four million dollar range that aren't actually on the market, but they're still available for sale. The moment you just put them all on the market, it just kind of puts the downward pressure on price. Um, so it, it, it's a tug of war in that price range. I wouldn't say that it's a uh, that it's a buyer's market. Um, Marina says, does uh, this apply equally for condos and apartments, lower price property? Yeah, all of this applies, right? Um, can't remember who it was. Someone, uh, oh, we, we we're showing a, a condo just listed on Dickens um really clean good condition 14 showings uh today one day 14 showings they just spaced them out one after another um so yeah the market under a million for houses and condos is very strong um Catherine asked i've heard that a number of loan product pro, lo a number of loan products including equity lines have disappeared are they beginning to reappear yeah we just talked about that a little bit um you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing that we, you know, the financial advisors were saying to us when this pandemic hit is go ahead and draw on your home equity line, right? Because I don't know if everyone has an automatic provi or a provision where they can just terminate it. But yeah, that was the advice. Don't know about that. Um, I don't have an equity line in my house, so I just didn't get involved with that. But yeah, we are starting to see some, you know, these non-QM type loans, the bank statement programs, they are starting to come back. Um, and they will, you know, it was, everyone was kind of scared to death. And the real reason that we were having this credit issue is, is because of the forbearance, right? If, if, if I'm going to purchase a house today, I can move in it tomorrow and just tell the bank, sorry, I'm not paying. Right. And, you know, so it, when you, when you create that kind of environment, it makes it harder for investors who supply the liquidity for that, those types of loans to want to jump into the market. So I think we're probably have a little bit more visibility as to how things are going to play out um, in terms of like, when does the, when does it get paid back? How is it going to get paid back and things like that? And that's making, you know, investors and lenders more comfortable. So yes, I think uh, some of these types of lenders will come back. And then another good question from uh, Diana Lynn, are you seeing many cash offers? Uh, no, I'm not. And I haven't seen cash offers really in a couple of years, you know, between, for, I would say that the everyone's got a different opinion as to when the market started coming back. You know, I think in 2010, they had that like uh, credit where uh, if you bought a house, you got like an interest, you got like a, um, a deduction on your income and then it went bumpy again and then it got a little bit better in 12. I think it really started happening in like 13 and 14. And I mean, I had, I don't know, I was selling 30 to 40 properties a year with like 
75% of those deals were cash. It was insane. It was just cash, 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 cash. Um, but in the last three, four years, uh, very few offers um, were cash. Still great down payments, which is the primary reason why we're not going to enter into another housing crisis. The amount of equity inside people's homes today is tremendously higher than it was before. Um, our most buyers uh, within California or coming from out of state. I'd say most are, are most are from within. Um, you know, I'm, we're getting a few people um, transferring in um, on some of our, I can't think of, I can't think of an offer right now on anything that I'm in escrow on right now where one of the buyers was coming from out of state. But certainly you get that, right? I'm, I'm moving to be closer to my kids, you know, that kind of stuff. So that that those types of uh, buyers do do come. All right, I kind of lost my place a little bit. Um, okay, so I think we're moving on to the last part of the discussion, which is how to sell your home safely. Um, and I think and basically it starts with how we market your property. So, um, Michael, why don't we go ahead and start moving with this to the slide. So the, the what we're doing right now is we are coming up with new ways, new technologies, and new um, ways to get people excited about real estate. Everybody's at home right now. Um, you know, the Zillows, the Trulias, the Redfins the, of the world are just, they're spiking because there's so many, pe so much people interested in real estate. Uh, Michael, you probably want to pause that video for a second. Um, I don't know if you can pause that video. And so, what we're now doing is trying to create media and content that gets people excited so that then we can get, kind of collect all our list of buyers and then figure out who really needs to see this house. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but okay. So th this first one here is a property video. Uh, Michael, go ahead. If you want to just show a couple seconds of it. Um, this is a, uh, a single family residence in, uh, in studio city. Um, you know, what this is doing it, is it gives you the ability, yeah, th this is me just talking about the, you know, the gorgeous maple floors, um, the custom fixtures and lighting throughout. So it lets me tell a story about the house, talks, it talks about the architectural detail. Um, so this is an example of the, of the property video, which really gets people excited. It's just one of the media that we use. We actually also have a less formal um, uh, video that we do on our phone, which I love. Um, yeah, Marina, it is a stunning home. It's beautiful. Um, it's it's really fun. Like I, I I just you know I can just go over to the house and just say, hey, it's Alan Taylor, and I start talking about things in the neighborhood. And it's interesting because it, during a showing, I might not do that. Like, it's not that I don't do that. I always, I always go like, how well do you know the neighborhood? And like, you know, did you know about this happening? And do you know about Sportsman's Lodge? Or have you been to Tony's? Oh my God, it's the best. Whatever the case may be. But, you know, in the, in the video, it, it allows me to talk about that kind of stuff. And that also gets people excited. Uh, Michael, let's show them Matterport. Okay, so this is a dollhouse. Um, and this is a, a, a Matterport. So, Michael, why don't you... Go ahead and just uh, maybe take them through the house if you don't mind. Take them straight to the back. You know, see those little circles there? It, 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 it doesn't look like, yeah, a little further. All right, a little more. Yeah, stop there. Stop there. Uh, so it, it Michael, Michael, you can kind of turn it around a little bit so they can kind of see. So it gives you the ability to kind of see the layout of the house. Um, and that's pretty much what we're trying to do with Matterport, okay? We're trying to, you can just leave it right here, Michael. We're trying to give people an understanding of the layout and the flow of the house, right? We used to just say, okay, you're interested in the house, then let's just set up a showing. And then the buyer would go there and go, oh, I didn't realize, or oh, I didn't know. And I think that's what the, the mayor and you know, I think that's what they want us to do is, is get these matter ports out there, help people understand the space, and see if it's the right fit for them. So that's that's what the Matterport does does really well. Uh, Michael, let's move on to the virtual open on Zillow. And now, you know, Michael and I have done a. We've just basically been just driving all these um, the MLS and um, Zillow's bananas. We, we, I've been complaining to Zillow for years about how poor of a job they do 
at showcasing a property video. Um, you know, we go out and spend a thousand dollars on a beautiful property video and the video is buried. Um, like you have to be, you have to just be searching for it to find it. So thankfully with this pandemic, you know, all of the MLS, the third party sites are giving us the ability um, to get more eyeballs on these Matterports and on these property videos. And, and it's amazing to me how many real estate agents don't actually know this, but what I can do is go in the MLS and I can do an open house on your property from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. or 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And I put in the whatever I want, either the property walkthrough video, the Matterport or the video, and it's open house, it's open all day long. And they can just press the button a lot. They can just press that live button and boom, I can immediately have them, you know, looking at your property, looking at the video and getting more information, which is really just driving the demand. It, it, the moment somebody sees my videos or sees my Matterports, they just, the realtors or their buyers just pick up the phone and say, when can I see this house? So it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Uh, tool. Um, Michael, can we do the uh, virtual open? And then, you know, so we're, you know, we're, we're trying to get creative here. Um, we obviously can't do the open houses today. So what we're doing is we're doing a live Q and A at the property and it's a, uh, we do them on Instagram. We could even do them on zoom. You know, we, we put out marketing just the same way we would e-blast social media, um, put it in the MLS, you know, tell the world that we're going to be open at two o'clock virtually. Everybody can log on and I can do my thing, right? Thanks for coming. Uh, how are you guys? We're standing here in front of blah, blah, blah. And let me tell you about the neighborhood and the sportsman's lodge. And do you know about the LA, the, the North side of the LA river and all these great things. And I'm going to show you the house and, you know, I'm touring 25 people through the house. Um, and it's, and it's great. Let's do, let's just show them targeted ads. And then I think we should probably move on and then targeted ads. I mean, you know, th these aren't new, but you know, social media, just YouTube, we're starting to do YouTube video ads now. Um, Google ads, Instagram and Facebook ads. And these are just really simple ways for us to get our uh, information about the property out to consumers who are online. And it really just drives the interest. Um, Michael, I think we can probably go back to present right now. Okay. All right. So now what do we do, right? We, we did a great job of marketing the property. We have all these people, um, you know, we, we, we really need to, you know, now qualify the buyer. Right. And that's, you know, what, what, what are my notes here? It says, uh, okay. So we, you know, we, 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 we're required to make sure that the buyer is qualified and the reality, what was, you know, there's this, there's a form, the PEAD form, which I'll show you in a minute, which basically the buyer has to acknowledge that they're not symptomatic and that they haven't been exposed to anybody with coronavirus. Right. But everyone's like, yeah, whatever, let's just sign it. Right. So what, what I do when I get 15 or 20 people saying, when can I show this house? I, I, I immediately establish a great relationship with the agent on the other end. I make them feel super comfortable. Like, hi, how are you? How are things? Are you surviving? Just kind of break the ice. And the moment I've got that real estate agent's trust, they just tell me everything that they know about the buyer. And they tell me things like, oh, they're not really qualified up to the purchase price, but they want to see it because in case the price comes down. And, you know, obviously I say, sorry, you're not coming. Um, one person even told me they're being, you know, oh, the wife got furloughed, but she really wants to see the house because she's going to get her job back. She's thinking maybe it's going to be a month. Like, I mean, you know, for somebody who's occupying and living in a house, I mean, look, it's, it's up to you, right? My job is to get as much information as I can and tell you about it. Um, but what the mayor wants us to do is, is eliminate any unnecessary showings. And that's basically what we're doing is we're qualifying the buyers. We're talking to the agents. Oh, I had another one, by the way, where the buyer um, was qualified. He had a pre-approval letter, but he had to sell his house first, right? And, you know, why would we want to, why would we want to sell our house to somebody who has to sell their house in a pandemic, you know, I mean, it's obviously possible, but I don't think that that's a showing that really needed to take place. So we just try to kind of qualify it down and limit the amount of people that are coming to the house that are not symptomatic and that can make, uh, and that can make the deal work. And that's what we're doing to try to protect our sellers. Um, Michael, you can go ahead and show the PEED form if you want. 
um, yeah, it's basically, it's a property entry and advisory declaration. Um, yeah, that's the form right there. And basically, um, you know, it, 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 they declare that they are not symptomatic. They have no knowledge that they are affected with or have come in contact with someone infected by coronavirus and that they agree to follow best practice guidelines, including the mandated wearing of masks and agree not to touch anything. Um, you know, and, 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 and as I was saying a minute ago, the problem with this form is surprisingly how many realtors and agents out there just aren't taking it seriously. So because of that, we've gotten new, um, new guidelines from, I think it's OSHA. Um, Michael, why don't we show the, the showing properties policy? Yeah, that one, if you could make that bigger. So Compass has come up with, uh, you know, an additional form here. And as you can see at the top, it says, in order to promote the health and safety of every person visiting or occupying this property during the marketing process, we've established the following policy, which must be acknowledged and adhered to. So, you know, it, ha it gets posted on the door. Um, we already talked about the maximum of two people uh, from the same family from, uh, coming. Here's, an here's another one that wasn't part of the PEED form. Every person entering the property must wash their hands with san hand sanitizer or soap and water upon uh, entering the property. And then, of course, every person entering the property must maintain social distancing at all time while on the property, which basically means, you know, I mean, you know, husband and wife, I would assume they can stay together, but the real estate agent shouldn't be within six feet of them. It should be in other rooms. And really, the real estate agent doesn't need to be in the house with them. You know, I get realtors who want to, they don't need to. If the real estate agent wants to come and they need to see the house and the seller is comfortable with it, then they can allow the realtor to come in at a different time from the, from the, from the buyer. They can do their own quick spin through so that they can just talk about the house, you know, you know, with education about the house. But the reality is the realtor doesn't need to see the house. The buyer can go in if they want it, they want it. If they don't, they don't. Um, what else? Um, yeah, and so while in the property, all persons must make every effort to avoid touching surfaces within the property, including countertops, doorknobs, cabinet handles. So what we're, and, it's, and there's also an acknowledgement that you know, the buyer's aware that the property is not being professionally clean between visits, et cetera, et cetera. And then also we have our sellers, you know, turn on all the lights, open up all the windows and doors, make sure that the house is absolutely 100% showing ready and try to create an environment where the buyer can just keep their hands in their pocket walk through the house with a mask on and then and then walk out and make up their make up their mind um i think we're done with that one michael let's see what else yeah i, think, I mean that's pretty much the presentation um i don't know if there are any other question let's see um do these ads cost more to the seller instagram no 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 this is all marketing thanks for that question diana lynn no the i pay for all these ads They're, um uh, the real estate agent pays for those ads. Um, yeah, and of course, can we ask for foot covers or shoes off 100%? Pretty much all my sellers are, 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 asking, are asking that. Um, and let's see, so I mean, we covered quite a bit of content. Um, I'd say to close it out, you know, now more than ever, um, you know, it's imperative to work with a professional who's, you know, on top of the market, who understands uh, how to market the property, how to safely qualify buyers, and how to limit the amount of buyers that are going into, into, into a home. And we're being successful. Um, and that's, you know, we're, we're, we're being successful, obviously, largely because there's, a, there's actually strong demand from buyers out there in certain price ranges um, in terms of getting houses under contract. And we're, we're now that we have this, uh, uh, this shown properties policy, I think we're going to be more um, successful in, in making sure that the sellers who choose to put the house on the market are, are, are able to do that very safely. Um, I think that's it. Michael, do you want to put up my contact information slide? Um, that's uh, pretty much it. If uh, you know, Here's my contact information here. Um, if you want to just take a picture with your phone or jot it down really quickly. Um, I'll, I can also email the attendees uh, who came. And I just want to thank everybody who took the time to come. I really, really appreciate it. Again, I know it's Friday afternoon. You guys are all probably exhausted from a long week. I'm not sure if this was a good time for me to, to do the call. Um, maybe another time, uh, maybe in the morning on a weekend would be better. But 
uh, someone says after 5 p.m. is better. Yeah, maybe, maybe after 5 p.m. is better, right? Um, all right, guys, will everyone be safe, be well, be healthy? Um, thank you again so much for uh, joining. It looks like there's in the chat, Michael, are there any more questions? Oh, the people are just commenting. Okay, thank you guys for the support and uh, be 